Over the last few decades, thousands of people of all nationalities and races have passed by this man, sitting here in the spa park in Bad Ischl. As in the past, so today, passers-by often glance at him suspiciously because of what he is doing. Can it be that there's a life story of specific interest behind this humble man, one that would make him appear in quite a different light than most people choose to see him? And would the history of the 20th century perhaps have been written differently if more of his contemporaries had acted like him? Leopold Engleitner was born on July the 23rd, 1905 in Eigenvogelhub, Austria. His father was also named Leopold and worked in a sawmill, while his mother was the daughter of a big estate owner. Engleitner spent his childhood in Fandl, a small village in the rural district community of Bad Ischl. He started work as a farmhand while still at a very young age, after which he was employed in many different jobs as a labourer. He then worked for the road construction department in Bad Ischl, starting at the beginning of the 50s, until his retirement in 1969. In 1949, Leopold Engleitner married Theresia Kurz, who had been left with two small children when her first husband had abandoned them. Together with his wife and adopted daughter Ida, Engleitner lived in Weinbach, a village in the rural district community of St. Wolfgang in the Salzkammergut. For seven years, Leopold Engleitner lovingly and unselfishly cared for his wife, Theresia, who suffered from acute diabetes, right until her death in 1981. Since then, he has been living by himself, but is still going strong, even doing most of the housework himself. He was still just a young boy when he experienced the monarchy era and can tell us many things about the life of Kaiser Franz Joseph of Austria, who was ruling at that time. Kaiser Franz Joseph, in Bad Ischl everyone called him Franzl, was a bad monarch but a brilliant hunter. To prove this, I'd like to tell you the following story. One day, a count invited the Kaiser to hunt for chamois. The head forester of that area was ordered to be at the Kaiser's disposal. While both were busy looking for an appropriate target, the forester spotted a chamois and whispered, Look, your majesty, what a magnificent buck! The Kaiser took a good look through his binoculars and said with a smile, That's no bug, that's a doe. They started arguing about who was right and who was wrong. The Kaiser claimed that he was right, because he knew that although the ends of the horns of a doe do stick out sideways normally, there are exceptions to the rule. For instance, when the doe is very mature. Anyway, since they couldn't settle the argument, the Kaiser shot the animal and was right after all. It was a doe. I always found that the Kaiser cared very little for the poor, since the local people were not allowed to wear ordinary clothes while strolling in the spa park during the summer season. Instead, they were forced to put on their Sunday best. During the day, a police officer would patrol the park to make sure that everyone was properly dressed. What I also saw with my own eyes was that the Kaiser regularly hurried to meet Katerina Schrapp at her house after the morning service in the church, even though she was a married woman. This too I found extremely objectionable. Not even close contact with the Kaiser in May 1914 could change the young boy's opinion of him. At the end of his summer vacation in Badischl, the Kaiser wanted to see all the school children of the village. We, the children, had to line up in front of the train station up to the Kaiser's summer residence. On this occasion, I also noticed all the medals on his chest. Where he got them from, I have no idea. 
but it was a sight I found repellent, since I was not used to people making such a show and display of themselves. As a schoolboy, Leopold Engleitner experienced the devastating effects of the First World War. The role that religions had played in this war raised many doubts in his mind. The senseless genocide and the terrible misery of that critical time created a strong abhorrence of war in him that was to influence his future life. Right after the war, on the breeding ground of the already weakened population, the Spanish flu killed about 20 million people worldwide. Engleitner also caught it, but survived after staying in bed with high fever for many weeks. For a long time, Engleitner suffered from the consequences of this malicious illness. Poverty prevailed everywhere, and because of that, the 13-year-old boy was forced to work as a farmhand. Then, in the following years, he worked as a domestic servant for farmers and at construction sites regulating the riverbeds of mountain torrents. In the early 30s, he was unemployed. Because of my thriftiness, I was able to purchase a piece of land in Weinbach, where I built myself a little house. The precious few hours of leisure time that Leopold Engleitner was able to spend in the 20s were used on what he loved most, nature. For hours on end, he would go hiking through the Salzkammergut mountain range with his friends. In the summer of 1930, St. Wolfgang was the stage for the motion picture Liebling der Goethe. The distinguished singer Albert Winkelmann, played by Emil Jannings, was returning home after a tour of South America. Leopold Engleitner was an extra for background scenes during the rapturous welcome. In this film, Hans Morser played his part brilliantly as a comedian while Engleitner was in the background. <laughs> The year 1932 came to be a turning point in Leopold Engleitner's life. It marked the beginning of the most important and most exciting part of it. As he wanted to leave the Catholic Church, however, he first had to show that he was courageous enough to go a different way. I went to the priest in Strobel and asked him for my certificate of baptism. Are you applying for a government post? he asked. No, I said. Do you want to get married? No, I replied. Good heavens, he cried out. What do you need it for then? I answered, showing no emotion. I want to resign my membership of the church. Laughing scornfully, the priest firmly said, I'll never give you this document. I simply told him, either you give me my baptismal certificate or I will get it with the help of the local authorities. He just threw me out. Therefore, I wrote a letter to the local government office in Gmunden, asking for its support to legalize my resignation from the Catholic Church. In May 1932, I was baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. From one day to the next, I was the object of general contempt. Some even spat on my feet when passing by. After Engleitner had crossed this first bridge, he began to realize what so many of his ancestors in the 17th century had had to go through. They had been big landowners and, having been driven from their homes in Bad Ischl, were forced to flee to Romania just because they confessed to Protestantism. Starting with his resignation from the Catholic Church, religious intolerance raised its ugly head again, and as all basic human rights were disregarded, he was severely persecuted from all sides. One day, an official from the labor office in Bad Ischl paid me a visit and told me that I was not allowed to receive further unemployment benefits. His argument was that no religious sect was tolerated in Austria. 
From that moment on, I was ousted from the labor market with no chance of any kind of employment and no income whatsoever. The labor officer's decision was in direct violation of the Treaty of Saint-Germain, signed in 1919, which stipulated in Section 5, Articles 62 and 63, that Austria was obligated to guarantee all inhabitants of Austria the right to the free exercise of any religion. But Leopold Engleitner was not going to be deterred by this decision, and therefore did not spare any time or effort in preaching the good news to the people of Upper Styria, the Lower Traun Quarter, and the Salzkammergut. But since the authorities were keeping an eye on him, he was arrested on Sunday, January 5, 1936, while preaching in St. Gilgen. The chief officer told me, I promise you, we'll soon put an end to this running around with the Bible. My answer was, the good news that we bring to the people does not originate with us. It is Bible-based, and you aren't able to stop it. It is from above. Yes, from above, he said mockingly. Up in heaven he can do the talking, I don't mind, but down here on earth, we have the say. Yes, I replied dryly, I've noticed that. What do you mean by that? said the officer, looking surprised. I said, I am unemployed, since I don't know when. And although you claim that you have the say here on earth, you are not even able to give me any work at all. Engleitner's quick-witted argumentation only brought him imprisonment, and he was put into custody in the district prison in St. Gilgen. Then, after three weeks, he was transferred by train to the provincial prison of Salzburg and fettered like a criminal. On March 30, 1936, a court case was opened against him at the county court and he was on trial on the basis of the Penal Law of Austria, paragraphs 122 and 303. I was charged for insulting a legally recognized church, but defended myself by pointing to the Peace Treaty of Saint-Germain, where it is stipulated that Austria, according to the Section 5, Article 62 and 63, was obligated to recognize the basic law that all of its inhabitants shall be entitled to the free exercise of religion. Still, I was sentenced to two months' imprisonment, but was released and could go home on the same day, since I had already done three months. Four months later, the case against Leopold Engleitner was dropped and amnesty was granted by Austria's president, Miklas. But he was arrested again, for the same reason, one and a half years later in Bad Aussee. Also in Bad Aussee, I was unjustly sentenced to one month's imprisonment. Fortunately, the conditions there were not too bad, as a hotel owner, who was in the same cell, got his food delivered from his hotel and shared some of it with me. When I was released again, my parents were surprised how well I looked and thought I must have been on holiday. This was the fourth illegal imprisonment that Leopold Engleitner had experienced after his change of religion. Then, in Bad Ischl on April 4, 1939, he was caught under the wheels of the merciless machinery of the cruel Hitler regime. On this evening, he had joined some other Jehovah's Witnesses at the Rothauer's house to celebrate the Last Supper. This came to an abrupt end. All of a sudden, we heard a knock on the window. I went to the door and asked, What's up? Gestapo, was the answer. What have we got to do with the Gestapo? I said. We are no criminals. We'll show you what you are, the intruders shouted, stormed into the room and pushed me to the side. Where are your watchtowers hidden? They roared. I looked surprised. But we don't have any watchtower magazines. We'd be glad if we had some. I tell you, but we haven't had any for a long time. They asked, then, for what reason are you all assembled here together? We are commemorating the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Surely that can't be forbidden, can it? After they confirmed that, of course, reading the Bible was not forbidden, they discussed for a while among themselves what to do and then said to us, if we were to view ourselves as an independent group which had nothing whatever to do with the Jehovah's Witnesses and without any compromise submit to Hitler, who was the Führer, they would abstain from arresting us. 
I simply told them, if that's the case, you have to ask the others also for their opinion. I can't speak for them, but I, for my part, can't agree to that. When no one agreed to that offer, four of them, including Leopold Engleitner, were taken away and confined in the district court in Bad Ischl at about 10.30 that evening. The official reason? Holding of a Bible discourse. After being questioned by the Gestapo in Linz the next day, Leopold Engleitner was transferred to the police detention house in Linz. He was then held in custody at the provincial prisons in Linz and Wels. They were shouting at us continually during the course of our interrogation, thinking that might scare us to death. Especially, the topic of military service was brought up several times during our examination. In connection with that, the judge once turned to me and said, while shaking his head, Engleitner, Engleitner, I am warning you for the last time, if you continue to object to military service, then you already have both feet in the grave. Change your ways. I just said, if I I've already got both feet in the grave just standing here. What on earth will it be like on the front lines? Or do they shoot with Swedes out there? At first, he made ever such a stern face because of what I just said, but when he saw I wasn't very impressed, he started smiling. To his great surprise, Leopold Engleitner also met the former provincial governor of Upper Austria, Dr. Heinrich Kleisner, who was with him in the same prison. One day, accompanied by a prison guard, I had to carry a batch of clean laundry to a certain cell. Prisoner, outstandingly polite, courteously said, Thank you. Going back to my cell again, I asked the guard, Who is that fine gentleman? Why, didn't you recognize him? He answered, It is the former provincial governor of Upper Austria, Dr. Heinrich Gleisner. The case against Leopold Engleitner was eventually dropped after an amnesty. Instead of being released, however, he was handed over to the Gestapo in Linz again, who decided what was to happen next. It was on October the 5th, 1939, that the senior guard of the police detention house in Linz came and told him the worst and most shocking news he would ever hear in his whole life. Yeah, Engleitner. Herr Engleitner, I'm very sorry, but in half an hour you will be transferred to Buchenwald concentration camp by train. You will still get something to eat, because who knows when you will ever have a full stomach again. Then on the train, I shared a cell with Dr. Heinrich Gleisner. He told me that he had got to know Jehovah's Witnesses, with whom he'd been imprisoned in Dachau concentration camp, and he said he marveled at the steadfastness of their faith. Then he asked me, but during the time I was in office, such a thing could never have happened, could it? I exclaimed, Herr Doctor, five times I was sent to court during that time, and it was then that even my unemployment benefits were cancelled. But, he responded, according to the peace treaty of Saint-Germain, we never had the right to do such a thing. Look, I said, at every court trial and at every opportunity I brought up these points as stated in the peace treaty, but nobody paid any heed to what I said. As of 1937, more than 250,000 people of over 30 different nationalities were transported like cattle to Buchenwald concentration camp on Ettersberg Hill. Under the most inhuman conditions, about 56,000 of them died in this horrific concentration camp. On Wednesday, October the 9th, 1939, Leopold Engleitner arrived at Weimar train station in Thuringia, Germany. It was late in the evening when he and the other detainees were ruthlessly squeezed into a prison lorry. They were then driven along what was called the Blood Road, which brought them to the Buchenwald camp. On arrival, the prisoners were herded along the Carajo Road and into the bunker, where they were exposed to the violence of the young bunker overseer Martin Sommer, a well-known tormentor and killer. Ten men were squashed together into one small prison cell. 
Afterwards, the overseer went through the bunker, stopping at each cell, bellowing at each one of us and wanting to know the reason why he had been brought to Buchenwald. And he also asked me. I said, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He dragged me out of the cell, hitting me like mad. When he saw that this didn't make much impression on me, he threw me into a pitch-dark cell, and there blows rained down on me from every side. I didn't know who hit me, since I couldn't see anything. In the end, someone knocked me down, and when he kicked me, I rolled under a bed, luckily for me, for now he couldn't reach me anymore. And every time he tried to kick me, I could hear his, oh, ouch, ah! because he kept banging his shim on the edge of the bed. The overseer heard this from outside, opened the door and turned on the light. Now I could see that it was a prisoner who had beaten me up. I learned later that he was ordered to do so. After that, the SS man Martin Sommer pushed him to the guardroom. In the guard room, the overseer started asking me things I could never have answered to his satisfaction. Therefore, he forced me to lean over a bench and started beating me with a switch on my back and on my behind, using the thicker end while holding the rod at the thinner one. And because that didn't bring him any satisfaction either, he shouted in frustration. I'll have to shoot you. However, before doing this, he allowed me to write a card home to say goodbye to my parents. But every time I started writing, he knocked my elbow so that after a short while, the card was full of scribbling. He shouted, look at this fool. He can't even write, but he can read the Bible. Then, after he had slowly pulled out his pistol, so that I would have time to get really scared, he pressed it against my temple and said, Now I'll pull the trigger. He then asked me, Are you ready? Yes, I said. Forget it, he snarled. You're even too stupid to shoot. After that terrifying experience, he brought me back to the cell. There was a chamber pot in it, like the one the children used during the night. And it was supposed to be big enough for ten men. Naturally, it was now full to the brim with urine, and I was ordered to empty it into the toilet. While I was carrying it, he hit me continuously on the head from behind, so as you can imagine, I spilled the pot's contents all over the place with every blow I received. He howled. Now look at this pig. He can't even carry a pot properly. Of course, when I reached the toilet, the pot was almost empty. Full of rage, he hit me all the way back to the cell, where, for the lack of room, I couldn't lie down, but had to keep on standing the whole night. Early in the morning, the new prisoners were led to the political section. As they passed the gate, Engleitner's eyes fell on the inscription, To each his own. It indicated that the tortures everyone had to endure as soon as they entered the gate were nothing more than they deserved. After Engleitner arrived at the camp, he stood next to Dr. Heinrich Gleisner as their particulars were registered. When Dr. Gleisner was asked what his profession was, he answered, I'm a lawyer. What? A Jew? This Esman said misinterpreting his answer, and hit him in the face. After that, it was my turn. They threatened to lock me up with the bears. At first, I thought this was funny, convinced that they were only joking. Later, when I saw the bears in the pit, I realized the danger I was in. As a newcomer, I was allotted to the penal company and received an outfit marked by a purple triangle which showed that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and a black dot which indicated that I was assigned to work in the quarry. The quarry provided the stones for the road construction in the camp. Work in this unit was one of the greatest tortures that people had to endure in Buchenwald concentration camp. 
Working methods were primitive, like the tools that we had to use, and there were never enough of them. Shovels and pickaxes were thrown in a heap from the ground, and for many it was worth fighting to get one of them, since anyone who missed the chance had to work the entire day just using his bare hands. This situation was almost unbearable, and even young detainees, 15 and 16 years old, were turning gray in a matter of weeks. Holes in the roll call square had to be filled. For this reason, heaps of rubble deposited in front of the camp had to be transferred transported into it on stretches. One day it happened that I, together with another prisoner, was hurrying through the gate with a loaded stretcher when the second camp leader, Hans Hüttig, turned up just in time to beat me with his whip so that I had to let go and drop the stretcher. Both of us ran as fast as we could and quickly mixed with the other laborers. Hüttig came looking for us. We all had to line up in rows of five, and he started to check each one of us. He looked straight into my face, but he didn't recognize me. After that, he checked us a second time, but he still didn't know it was me that he was looking for. And finally, we were ordered to start working again. The winter months between 1939 and 1940 were very severe, and temperatures as low as minus 36 degrees prevailed. Due to the weakened condition of those imprisoned, dysentery broke out in the camp, and the penal company was isolated. Within just 10 weeks, hundreds of them died. Paul bearer to the gate. These words could be heard all over the camp every day. Happily, Leopold Engleitner was not only spared by this malicious illness, but also survived the hard labor in the quarry. After a certain period of quarantine, he was assigned to Block 44 together with all the other earnest Bible students, as Jehovah's Witnesses were called in the camp. In the future, the daily schedule of labor was to be organized by the much feared first camp leader, Arthur Rödel, who was from Munich. Rödel's secretary, Fritz Adler, told Engleitner the following. Tomorrow you'll be introduced to the camp leader Rödel. I'd like to give you a tip. Don't speak high German. He can't stand it. So I was ordered to the camp's office the next day. The camp leader glanced at me and asked in broad Bavarian slang. Ah, where does this fellow come from? From the Salzkammergut, I replied. What, from Ischl? he asked inquiringly. No, but from St. Wolfgang, I answered. No, really, he's from Wolfgang, where I went with my friends to the White Stag Inn every Sunday and got drunk. Then he commanded, let's assign him to Walter Schneider. Schneider was the capo of a group of prisoners and was assigned to assist workers of a certain construction company to erect a huge sewage plant in Buchenwald concentration camp. For more than one year, Leopold Engleitner worked with this group. One of my workmates was an engineer, but had to work in the camp as a bricklayer instead. Although a member of the German Catholic Center Party, he was upset with the Pope because he not only supported Hitler, but had also withdrawn his support of the party. We seem to have many things in common since the Pope didn't like the witnesses either, and somehow we started to take a liking to each other. Something else made these men feel close to each other, and this was their interest in the books of the Austrian poet Peter Rosecker. Engleitner learned many interesting and amusing details about the writer from this engineer. One story goes like this. Peter was a poor peasant's son, but because he was so intelligent, his father sent him to a secondary school. So that he would look smart there, his father bought him a pair of trousers which were far too long. The boy went and asked his mother to shorten them for him. She forgot about it. He asked his sister. She forgot as well. His last hope was his grandmother. She didn't do it either. Why? Because she forgot. Later, all three of them remembered Peter's request, and all three of them shortened his trousers. Next morning, to Peter's dismay, his new trousers were far too short. Such amusing stories temporarily took their minds off the merciless drudge of everyday life in the concentration camp. The terrible situation the prisoners were in was also sometimes relieved by courageous lorry drivers from the construction company. 
The lorry drivers could see that we were undernourished and very hungry. Therefore, they secretly tried to supply us with food, so that we would know where the packages with bread and sausage were hidden in the sand they delivered. We agreed to a certain sign that would tell us where to look. A toothpick or a matchstick, either in the right or left corner of one of the lorry driver's mouths, would tell us on which side of the lorry the food was hidden. We watched every driver very carefully, as you can imagine. After we had found the packages with food, we hid them in order to eat some of it later. Leopold Engleitner also came to work together with a Catholic clergyman who was a former fellow worker of the Cardinal and Archbishop of Vienna, Theodor Initzer. The Cardinal had been a great supporter of Austria's annexation to the German Reich. The Catholic priest was rather annoyed about Cardinal Initzer, since he himself stood firm against Hitler, while the Cardinal supported his policy willingly. In the summer of 1940, the first camp leader, Arthur Rödel, felt sympathy for Leopold Engleitner and came to his aid. On Sundays, the prisoners were usually allowed to have the day off work, but when one of them had done something that warranted punishment, they were all forced to work in the quarry that particular Sunday. With such collective penalties, the Nazis wanted to sow hatred into the community of the detainees. I almost collapsed after two of the prisoners loaded a heavy stone upon my shoulders. The first camp leader, Rödel, happened to see this and ordered me to let the stone drop to the ground. At first, I didn't understand. I couldn't imagine that he was serious. But when he repeated his command, I realized that he meant well, so I let it drop. With his boot, he kicked a smaller stone over to me and ordered, you must carry this one into the camp. Jehovah's Witnesses were extremely harassed with overwork by the Kapos, and the first camp leader didn't like that. That is why on that day he gave the order, this afternoon the entire Block 44 stays in its barrack, because these men have been very hard working today already. About 400 Bible students were housed in Block 44, a two-story stone building. The walls of the rooms were lined by three rows of beds, one above the other, and covered with straw or wood wool. Each morning was the beginning of a day more terrible than the last. What all of us dreaded most was the shout every morning, out of the beds! We rushed and hurried to the washroom, then we had breakfast, which was just a cup of coffee substitute. The morning roll call was very early in the day, and after that we hurried off to work. For lunch we had stew, and there was never enough. The evening roll call was very late, just before sundown. Physically exhausted but spiritually strong, the Bible students unswervingly kept holding fast to their conviction. They found the spiritual means to keep their faith alive every day and even risked their lives just to get hold of a Bible somehow. When a Bible was smuggled in, it was taken apart and divided up into single books. I got the book of Job, which I somehow had to keep hidden on my body. I was only able to read it during the night, and after three months I had to return it. Every Sunday we would listen to a biblical talk on the first floor of Block 44, whilst some of the brothers kept watch so that we would not be taken by surprise. One Sunday, it was my turn to keep watch. All of a sudden, someone patted me on the shoulder. It was an SS man who, pointing upwards, said, just carry on. His gesture indicated that he had known all along about our secret meetings and had no objection to them. The Bible students were among the selected few detainees who were allowed to shave the SS men because they knew that they would not be harmed in any way.
In March 1941, Leopold Engleitner, together with 90 other prisoners, was deported in a freight train to Niederhagen concentration camp in Wewelsburg. The Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler had big construction plans for Wewelsburg in mind, where a gigantic SS headquarters was to be built, which had been planned by the architect Bartels. To accomplish this huge task, a large crowd of laborers was required. Since many of the prisoners had been shot when trying to escape, Heinrich Himmler decided to use the hard-working Bible students. Firstly, to work them to death, and secondly, because he knew that they would never try to escape. Out of 3,900 prisoners, almost 1,300 found their agonizing death in Niederhagen concentration camp. For Leopold Engleitner, detainee number 46, the imprisonment in Wewelsburg in Westphalia meant two more years of humiliation. I was assigned to the electrician's unit, which was responsible for maintaining the electrified barbed wire fence. While we were at work, the electricity had to be switched off. The Bible students were the only ones who never tried to escape. For that reason, they also brought in the harvest. And since I used to work as a farmhand, I was assigned to the harvest unit as well. From May until August, we only had nettle soup to eat, and I got more hungry every day. As we lost a lot of weight, we grew thinner and thinner, and our strength declined drastically. Writing letters was also a problem. We were only allowed to write ten words once a month. So that the SS would know that my fuse remained unchanged, I always wrote, I am well and steadfast. At one point, Leopold Engleitner was assigned to the tree felling and woodcutting unit by the SS. While working for this unit, he encountered the tyrannical prisoner Max Schuler, a much feared capo who behaved very much as the SS liked him to. Schuler was a criminal who already had quite a large criminal record, and he treated the prisoners under his command with unthinkable inhuman cruelty. He particularly liked to take out his aggression on Leopold Engleitner. Our unit had to work on some trees. Next to us, there was the capo Max Schüller with his unit, which had to dig trenches for the rifle range. All of a sudden, this capo came storming over to us, shouting, You lazy dogs! I'll teach you how to work harder. There were holes left where the rootstocks of the trees used to be, which were now filled with rainwater. So Max Schüller, standing in front of me, commanded, Go on, jump into the hole. I answered in no uncertain terms, No, I won't do it. Then I'll throw you in, he threatened through clenched teeth. Just try it, I said with confidence. He grabbed me, and because I clung to him very tightly, we fell into the root hole together. Filled with rage, he got hold of the broken handle of a shovel and began to bludgeon me with it, screaming, Now I'm going to kill you! A sentry who was standing not far away from the scene was able to intervene by shouting, Max, stop it! Max Schüller, who had hurried over to this SS man, was now threatening him as well. And I'll report you, because you are defending an enemy of the state. Then all the sentries, being alarmed, came over and they all sided against that capo who dared to threaten an SS man. Another time we were punished by getting drilled on the roll call square. Who was in charge? The extremely violent Max Schüller. He commanded so fast, up, down, up, down, that I couldn't follow anymore. So I just kept lying on the ground and happily no one took any notice. Having narrowly escaped the threats of this tyrant, Leopold Engleitner almost lost his life while being just a little too careless. There were many small beech trees standing outside the camp. One day, Camp Commandant Haas ordered, We have good use for them in the camp. Take one with you every time you return in the afternoon. After our regular working hours, I went to fetch one. All of a sudden, I heard the sentry's voice calling over to where I was standing. Hey, where do you think you're going? Can't you see? You're beyond the line of sentries. 
I could have shot you. Still shaking with fright, I simply apologized, but then asked him, of what benefit would it have been to you if you had shot me? He said with a grin, I would have been granted two weeks military furlough. Leopold Engleitner really appreciated this act of consideration, since it was an expression of some kind of humanity within an environment marred by hatred, violence and death. But cruel reality soon caught up with him again. One day, as Leopold Engleitner was drawing water from a stream, a cunning sentry was looking for an opportunity to get himself extra military furlough. I had to take water to where the houses for the SS were being built and was ordered to fetch some from the nearby stream which ran beyond the line of sentries. I was strictly ordered to ask the sentry for his permission every time I passed him in order not to be shot. Now, every time I asked the SS man for his permission to pass the line, he would just turn on his heels as if he hadn't heard me. I started thinking that he presumably didn't want me to report to him every time I passed. Therefore, I continued going down to the stream without asking. Suddenly, I heard a click-click noise, like someone loading his rifle. Quickly turning round, I just dropped the bucket and threw my hands up into the air. You didn't ask for my permission to pass, shouted the sentry, aiming his loaded rifle at me. I tried to defend myself by saying that I had even asked three times, but was deliberately ignored. The sentry wanted to have me punished, but another SS man who had witnessed this incident from close by warned the man, leave him alone. The prisoner did ask three times for permission to pass. After Leopold Engleitner had so narrowly escaped death, he was forced to witness a terrible scene. It was on a cool day when all the internees were ordered to the roll call square and had to stand in line in front of gallows, the shape of goalposts. They were forced to watch the execution of a fellow prisoner who had tried to escape. This cruel display was to serve as a warning for all of them. A young man was to be executed by hanging. When they put his neck into the noose, I tried to turn away so I wouldn't see it. An SS man who was watching me held my head with both hands and turned it towards the scene. I closed my eyes ever so tight in order not to see, but unfortunately I was still able to hear the awful sounds. In the autumn of 1942, after a hard working day in the field, it was proposed to him that he could be released. His freedom seemed to be within reach. I was assigned to a small harvest unit again. It was evening when the leader of the unit told me that I had the chance to be released and could work for a peasant who desperately needed someone to lend him a hand. The next day I had to show up at the political section where they told me that there was the possibility for me to be released. But on what condition? They wanted me to sign a declaration renouncing my beliefs. I said, I'd like to work as a farmhand, but I can never sign this paper. With this declaration, the SS tried to entice the Bible students to renounce their faith. One signature and they would have been free again. But like Leopold Engleitner, most of them were not willing to pay the price. A few days later, another peasant in the neighborhood requested some prisoners for the beetroot harvest. Leopold Engleitner, together with three other Bible students and guarded by two young SS men, was assigned to this unit that would work outside the camp. Those two guards looked very tired. We asked them if they would like to have a little nap. They said they would, but felt uneasy since they thought they might be checked by some camp officials later. We assured them that we would keep watch. Soon they were sound asleep with the rifles next to them in the grass. For us, it was a very strange sight. In the afternoon, when our work was done, we just woke them up. After they thanked us for the nice rest they had had, we went back to the camp together. At Wewelsburg train station, where he had to pack tools, Leopold Engleitner again experienced the brutality of the SS on his own body. One day, on the way home, he had to join another working unit and because he couldn't keep pace, a small gap had developed between him and the one walking in front. A guard noticed this, 
grew very angry and brutally kicked him from behind with his boot between the legs into his abdomen. Leopold Engleitner doubled up in pain, then collapsed on the spot, unable to move. I couldn't walk anymore. The others had to carry me into the camp. At the evening roll call, I had to lie on the ground next to my fellow prisoners. Later I found out that the guard had crushed one of my testicles. Although still very much in pain, he had to work the next day again and was not even allowed to be treated for his injuries. At the beginning of November 1942, Leopold Engleitner, together with about 100 inmates, was assigned to collect potatoes to be stored for the winter. This happened to be next to the crematorium. While we were working, I noticed that my fellow prisoners were eating roasted potatoes, and that made my mouth water. The assistant of the crematorium turned to me and asked, do you know where they get roasted? I had no idea. Then he showed me where, in the crematorium. I shuddered with horror since I had seen the corpses before. They were covered with ulcers and boils. In April 1943, Himmler stopped the construction work and Niederhagen concentration camp was closed. For this reason, Leopold Engleitner was deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp in the spring of 1943. Ravensbrück concentration camp was originally intended for women only, but from 1941 onward the camp was enlarged to accommodate 20,000 men as well. Altogether it had held 153,000 prisoners, tens of thousands of whom died. Leopold Engleitner was registered as detainee number 3523. He had seen many terrible things, but what awaited him there was beyond his worst fears. This camp was so overcrowded that for new prisoners there was nowhere to sit when eating their meager, watery soup. His whole body had been covered in festering ulcers for months, so the pushing and shoving of the crowd was particularly painful for him. The conditions in this camp were unbelievable. Because we could seldom change our clothes, we were covered with lice bites. In addition, the other prisoners were hateful to us Bible students and even more harassing than the SS itself. This I experienced personally on Whit Sunday, 1943. At the morning roll call, it was announced, there will be no laboring today. Instead, your dirty outfit shall be washed clean and hung up to dry. Nobody is allowed to leave the barrack before four o'clock in the afternoon. After four, when we were allowed to have some leisure time, I looked and I could hardly believe my eyes. My clean trousers were gone. I was shattered. What was I going to do? Well, I thought there is nothing else I can do but to line up for the roll call in my underpants. Unfortunately, the camp commandant took the roll call himself and when he saw me in my underpants, he said obviously surprised, this one's lined up here in his underpants. Why is that? Coming out. I tried to explain. Herr Lager, Commandant, you told me what to do, and I did just as you said. After I washed my outfit, I hung it up to dry in the sun. But when I wanted to take it down again in the afternoon, my trousers were gone. Why didn't you report it to the Stubendienst? He asked me. But I did, Herr Lager, Commandant. He just boxed my ears. Stubendienst, come out, the camp commandant shouted, and being very angry, he grabbed the Stubendienst and also boxed his ears very heavily. He shouted, when I give the command to clean the outfits, this should be in order. If the trousers are still missing tomorrow, there will be no meal for the whole camp, and that for the entire day. This order was not without results. The next morning, what a surprise, my trousers were hanging there again, but wet, without triangle and number. It was July 1943 when all of a sudden everything took a turn for the better for Leopold Engleitner. Without being forced to sign a declaration renouncing his faith, he was released and so escaped the murderous machinery alive. 
How is this possible? I was ordered to the guard room where an SS man made me a proposition. You can be released. But without a signature, I interrupted him abruptly. That's not necessary, he said. You only have to put yourself under obligation to work solely in agriculture in the future. And this I was ready to do. Then I was introduced to the camp medical officer. He asked me, you are still a Jehovah's Witness? I said, Jawohl, Herr Hauptsturmführer. We are not allowed to release you then, are we? He remarked. After staring at me for some time, he finally said, But I tell you what, we are glad to get rid of such a wretched creature as you. In that he was right, since I was covered in ulcers and weighed only 28 kilos. After over four years of the most inhuman and brutal treatment, Leopold Engleitner returned home on July the 16th, 1943. Following his release from Ravensbrück concentration camp, Leopold Engleitner began his forced labor as a farmhand for Johann and Franziska Unterberger, who had a farm in Windhag in the rural district community of St. Wolfgang. He thought that the end of the Second World War was just around the corner and hoped the worst was over, until one day, about three weeks later, all of a sudden, he was summoned to a military medical examination. The army doctor asked me, you don't want to join the army, do you? You are right, Herr Doctor, I said. But why not, he wanted to know. Now, I'd like to tell you something. When I was a boy, I stood in front of my teacher in just the same manner as I stand before you now. Just because I couldn't stand up straight without pain. I see, he said. I must examine that a little closer. Get undressed. After a short examination, he confirmed, you're right, I must admit that exemption from military service should be granted to you. But after a week, I was called in again, and now the same doctor who had exempted me a week ago from being called up, drew out my medical report from his pocket that said, to be used at the front lines, troops substitute reserve number one. Then, on April the 17th, 1945, Leopold Engleitner received his call-up papers. Within six hours, he had to report to the headquarters in Krumau, Czechoslovakia. Since I was determined not to join this crazy war, I had no choice but to escape into the nearby mountain region. In the night of April the 17th to April the 18th, 1945, Leopold Engleitner started his escape from the claws of the NS military police. He fled over the Wielinger Wand into the forests on the southern slope of Leonsberg Mountain. He was now a deserter, a conscientious objector, and everyone had the right to shoot him. I just walked on and on because the weather was wonderful and there was a warm wind blowing. In the evening, I prepared my bed with branches that I broke off from some trees. Since I was frightened that someone might spot me, my sleep was so light that I woke up every time I heard even the slightest sound of a falling leaf. Then in the morning, I continued walking again. After a week, the warm fern wind subsided and cold winter weather returned to that region. It even started to snow very thick and heavily again. I was soaked to my skin, so that I saw no other possibility but to find shelter in the Meister eben Alphut, belonging to the family Unterberger. When I got there, I found enough wood lying around to light a fire to get warm again, and also to dry my clothes. Feeling absolutely exhausted and tired, I stretched out on the bench next to the fire and was quickly asleep. Suddenly, I shot up with a terrible pain in my back. I was literally on fire. Fortunately, I had the presence of mind to roll myself on the ground to extinguish it. After I finally put out the blaze, I realized that my entire back was burned and I found myself in severe pain. Since my outfit was burned at the back as well, I put it on back to front so that the burns on my back were protected. What could he do in the middle of the night? 
He had no other choice but to go back to the Unterbergerhof to be able to treat his burns somehow and get some new clothes. In great fear of being detected, he stealthily went down to the farm. Despite shivering with fever, he was so thirsty that he stopped at every stream to take a drink. It was almost daybreak when he arrived at the farmhouse, but Franziska Unterberger was afraid and sent him away again. He was being searched for everywhere. I had to go to my parents. They didn't like the idea of hiding me for a while, but I had no other choice since a new day was already dawning and I could have been easily detected. So they had to take me in. I found myself a hiding place in the hayloft. My mother then came with some wet towels to cool my burns. She also brought some soup that she had put into a milk can and lifted up to me with the help of a hay fork. After two days, I had had enough of my parents lamenting and I chose to leave them again. I found myself a cave situated on a mountain slope. It was very small and not very high, therefore I couldn't stand erect. Using moss and branches, I made myself comfortable in it. It was a fine hiding place and I had a good view all over the region. Nobody could have ever taken me by surprise. This ideal hiding place was especially important as a Nazi search party was already on his heels. After some days, the warm wind returned and the new snow that covered the earth began to melt again. Bad for me, since the cave I was lodged in was made of limestone, where the water kept dripping through into the cave, and soon I was soaked to the skin. When I developed bad diarrhea as well, I had to move, because I would not have survived another night there in the cave. I had to go back to the Meister Eben Alp hut. After having arrived in the hut, I lit a fire again, but this time I was more careful. Then, with some hay I still found in the hut, I made my bed. At the back of the hut, there was a small door through which I would be able to escape in case of emergency. I felt quite secure now, even more so since I had a nice view of the Lake Attersee where I thought I could watch for any signs that the war had ended. But the danger was not over yet. The NS search party was still searching for him. There were three Nazis together with the mountain guide Franz Kain, who knew the region like the back of his hand and was forced to show them the way. As a former workmate of Engleitner, he was familiar with his attitude, especially in connection with his rejection of military service. The scouts had already searched through all the huts and lodges in the neighborhood, but without success. Franz Kain, presuming that Engleitner was hiding at the Meister Eben Alp hut, had so far managed to keep the Nazis away from it. Thick fog made it difficult for them to find their way, but with the use of a map, the group came to Breitenberg Mountain, close to where Engleitner was hiding. Not far away from the hut, the leader stopped, looked at his map and said, There must be another hut down there, the last one. We will pay it a visit. Now Kain had to protest. He said, Now, with this fog, it is much too dangerous for me to climb down to that hut. The leader remarked, If it is really that dangerous, then we will go down some other time. This was how Kain managed to divert the leader's attention away from the hut. If the Nazi had stuck to his plan to climb down to pay me a visit, it would have meant my arrest and certain death. A short time after this perilous situation for Engleitner, the German Reich capitulated. On May the 5th, 1945, it was no longer dangerous for Leopold Engleitner to return home. This adventurous escape had saved him from certain death, because at the base in Komau, which he had to report to, there were no survivors after an attack by Czech troops. It really had paid off that he, Leopold Engleitner, even when threatened with death, had stuck to his principles. His way was different. He just said no, and could thus keep a clean conscience. Leopold Engleitner's life proves that it was possible to say a clear no to Hitler's regime of terror. 20th century history would surely have been written differently if more of his contemporaries had acted as courageously as Leopold Engleitner.